Um, and then what we are doing for the second part of the year, what we're focusing on, and where we're going to get ready for next fall already. What do you want questions, Elena? I mean, we're in a work session here. So do you want them as we're moving along, or? That's fine. I think mean, that's better. I feel like than waiting for the very end. So it's the same time. Yeah, throw it out. Okay. The first thing I wanted to, oh, let's see. The first thing I wanted to bring attention to, ODE just released this early January. Basically, they're going to be designating, and I'm not sure how much, but a portion of their extra three cents towards revising uh, our state literacy framework. So they're calling it the Oregon K-5 Literacy Investment initiative and basically what they're going to be doing we don't have a ton of information but as of right now they're going to be focusing on revising and revisioning our current literacy framework which we have to adhere to as a district the last time it was really revised was in 2009 so you can imagine it's pretty outdated compared to uh, a lot of the not current research but research that has finally come to light uh, so this is really exciting because they actually named the science of reading in their visioning statement that they're one of their main objectives is to elevate knowledge and practice known as the science of reading so that it will be really reflected in the framework uh, so that the framework will also include research about teaching literacy to learners or uh, to with disabilities and students who speak other dialects other than English. They're also saying, talking about releasing a series of professional development. I'm not sure what that's going to look like yet. I'm not sure if they're going to be providing funding or opportunities in the CSE. I'm hoping that uh, I'm hoping that the professional development that they do provide, one or the other, really is grounded in education on the science of reading. So I don't know if that's going to be letters or, or something else that's more organic, but. Um, looking forward to opportunities for our teachers with that. And overall, one thing I noticed when they were speaking around the equity that this will bring to our system as, as a state and for all districts in our state is that it will also bring coherence with instructional materials and evidence-based practices and assessment. So I'm I'm interested to see kind of where they go with that because our state is pretty general as far as requirements for curriculum and materials and what the standards that we have to meet is pretty is pretty general. Uh, so I'm excited. I hope that we get something that more is in line, some guidance and criteria that's more aligned with the science of reading. So more to come late spring, they said. We're expecting a revision in late spring and then hopefully some guidance as far as what professional development opportunities come our way. Um, probably not as soon as I'd like. We would like to start planning for that right now in order to be ready in the fall, but it's just really exciting that we keep talking about this. Uh, and also, I'm very relieved that we are ahead of the game with this. Uh, it would be a different story right now if we adopted a curriculum that was not aligned with the science of reading. Uh, but we are not going to have to make any shifts. We have a curriculum that is absolutely based on best practice and what we know from the science and from the research. So we are going to be able to hit the ground running with whatever guidance they give us. So I might just add on there, what we're hearing from the budget side is that there will be a large literacy effort that will have substantial investment in it. I'm not sure if that's a carve out yet, or whether that's a, an added. Um, but those are all things that we're also, I think that, I think this is actually the same thing, but we're not sure yet. Um, we're kind of hearing it from different parts of the government right now, but, um, and then the other part would be the PD letters is great, but it's like a two-year program. And so finding a, a PD that maybe fits better that we could get to all 150, 160 um, elementary teachers, but we'll wait to see how that kind of rolls out and see kind of where they're headed with that. All of it's exciting, but just one kind of 
tell you what I'm hearing from budget side of this. So what are we currently focusing on? Where's the work happening right now? Happy to say all of our materials are distributed in all classrooms pre-K-6 in Spanish and English. We are continuing ongoing PTE in the SIT and we're sending out surveys about a month prior to each SIT to find out for teachers what they need before we develop those uh, SIT topics. So that has been really helpful with the feedback we're getting in SIT what our coaches are presenting on and giving support in is, is what teachers need. Optional PD sessions for those that want and have the bandwidth to learn more that and where we can't offer it during contract time, we have an offering additional, and that's, that's uh, something that the coaches are doing as well. I have been doing walkthroughs with principals, uh, focusing on professional learning around the curriculum itself and instructional pedagogy and just what are we looking for, what are you looking for, and we're not really any two in the week yet, we're mostly just focusing on the course. <laughs> Are these things being done during literacy time? Let's look at the students. Let's see how they're engaging with the curriculum. Uh, you know, grade level text, uh, what skills look like, what does the knowledge time look like, and just starting to learn that with principals. So it's not evaluative in any way. It's, it's really learning for administrators so they can start to become familiar with the literacy core. We're also uh, still conducting our M class and Matura meeting assessment pilot. That's happening at Joseph Gale and Herbie Clark Kindergarten. That's been happening since, since the first of the year. So we're continuing to monitor that pilot. We've got instructional coaching going uh, consistently. Uh, they're, they're overwhelmed actually at this point with the number of requests for support that they're getting. They're doing everything from teachers saying, I need to figure out how to get my kids here, or yeah, I have a goal based on what I this lesson is telling me to do. I'm not sure how to do it. Can you come and help me set a goal and figure out how to teach it? Other than saying, can you just come model this? Because I have, like, I'm reading it, but I don't know what I, I don't know really what it looks like yet. I've never taught this before. So, a lot of modeling, um, helping lesson plan, uh, things of that nature. So, a lot of that happening this year. Also working very closely with Laura Manon, who has been fantastic, our dual language facilitator. She's really been working closely. She's also the Spanish literacy on our, our literacy team as well. Facilitator, but she's been working with us to help just monitor how does the curriculum fit within the dual language model. And it's not a perfect fit. So we're trying to learn how do we need to improve it and what do we need to do to make it fit so that it works for students that are in the dual language program. Then we're also currently still monitoring our sixth grade Spanish literacy pilot. Recall, Amplify does not offer a sixth grade Spanish counterpart. So we're doing a pilot for sixth grade right now of um, Spanish science of Amplify, which has the price can be about 70%. So we're going to get there. So thank you very much. In class and like the career assessment, I would talk about that. So MCLAS and Matura are the assessment, those are the assessments, English and Spanish, that uh, are amplified, they're amplified assessment, but it really is civil. So it's civil based, uh, based edition is what they call it. So that is what we are planning to bring on board next fall. And that would replace currently our EDM and our STAR. It's a reading screener, it's an early indicator reading screener. So it screens for the number of students are infected yet and or risk factors that are flat or the students are not progressing as they would expect that based on certain benchmarks. So we started that pilot at Joseph Gale because they are new language. And class and Lentora is one of the few um, assessments that are uh, by literacy, literacy. So we're able to look at English and Spanish and, them and really identify strengths in English, strengths in Spanish. So that's been working really well, um, and it's di it's digital this year. So they're giving all the assessments digitally online with the iPad. So we're they're moving away from and they moved away from paper pencil up last year. They used an medium, which is all digital. So they had already done the digital component. So this was another reason why we decided to pilot this and scale the learning curve with fairly small. So we knew. So those two are going to replace two the medium curve. Yeah, the goal is that it's it's the goal is that system system wide we all use M class and look for K6 in place of using the start. 
and there's pockets of other things that other schools use in order to do the damage assessments and whatnot. Um, and so we're hoping that, that those two assessments right there cover our bases. How often? Well, the minimum would be the benchmarks, but it, it, it has wonderful progress monitoring. So Joseph Gale is progress monitoring. They're using that feature as well. So you can use it for both progress monitoring and for your benchmarks. So for progress monitoring, how many times? Um, well, and for the benchmark, just yeah, for the benchmark. Pardon me. Do we replace our current benchmark assessments? Okay. Or we do, and we're working on being the old app um, for this requirement. So, was that here? Yeah. Fall. So the benchmark is fall, winter, spring. Progress monitoring is a little bit more dependent on the kids that are in, in group for intervention, but usually most progress monitor every two to three weeks. Now, one of the advantages here is this will actually begin to give data back to the teachers in real time what standards kids are mastering and what standards they aren't. It'll give them. Um, much better. And are those, when you talk about those assessments being new ones, we currently are doing that much assessment then. We are so trying. Is it, is it the same amount of assessment or is it more or less? Yes. And it varies on the progress monitoring. So I would say right now, each building is a little bit different on how much they progress monitor or how often. I would say that's one of our objectives for next year is that everyone's aligned. So everyone's progress monitoring is based on the same criteria and in the same scope and sequence. But everyone does benchmark three times a year, fall, winter, spring, and everyone does progress monitor. Um, it's just how often and how consistent kind of is consistent, but it kind of varies how many. How long is the progress, progress monitor? I mean, ideally, you're supposed to progress monitor every two weeks. Every no, I mean, 10 days. Like the length of the angle, because we're where, oh, where, 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 okay. I think right. where it's going is happening. I guess, what, I guess what I'm looking at is what we currently do, right. and how often we do it, and how much time is it, right. and how much are we going to do it, and how often do we do it, right. and how much time is it. Right. Right. I don't think there's going to be, there might be, at first, it might take a little bit longer to do the assessment in the lower grades. Uh, because it, there's also going to be a learning curve, curve of digital uh, test taking, but on the part of the tester. Uh, but I don't think I talked a lot when we were when we were like, when they started this when they started M class. It was kind of the same kind of learning curve and over time we take that case. So I'm not really concerned about um, overall once we get this going that it's going to be significant more testing time. It's just going to be the learning curve of a new assessment and then the digital. And we can bring back, um, like I can give you a more like right. in depth analysis because depending on the grade level, different tests are yeah. going to different times, and yeah. you know, we're reading versus sound identification in a minute. Yeah, so yeah, I'd be interested in to have your okay. So, will you in the fall um, purchase or is it part of the program for the interventions for? For the student program, because you know they have that new new group. Um, are we going to see that? Yes. So for tier two, so for our um, intervention intervention supports for a reteaching or pre teaching, we already have that component within the core curriculum. For kids that need more intensive reading intervention, there's reading remediation. Uh, we are planning on this first. Which is, and I have that in slide a little bit later, but okay. um, first is the tier three and tier three intervention. And uh, that is directly, uh, directly is pulled from the M class and the current data. So once you take that assessment, then it it identifies what kids need and, and, and then it designs specially designed lessons for them called first. And the reason why they're called first is because the first is 10 lessons. And the, the approach is that you first take kids you know, for 10 days. And then you progress monitor them, and the idea is that hopefully then they learn that skill, and then they move out, and then you bring new kids in. So it's not a level approach, which is what we're getting away from, which is you level kids, and then you just continue to provide instruction at those levels. We're trying to provide intervention based on skill. And yes, that's part of our budget. Good. Okay. Any other questions? 
All right, so what's working well? We've got a lot of things that are working well. We are happy to find that the phonics pieces are incredibly strong, and we were hoping that that would be the case. We did a lot of digging uh, deep into the curriculum last year, but you just don't really know until you actually start teaching it just how quality and depth it really is. And we're really happy to happy to see that it is direct, it is explicit, it's systematic, it's multi-sensory, it's all the things that we really want. So uh, we're, we're just really excited. Handwriting, you've also gotten a lot of, this is all, by the way, feedback that I pulled from the survey from teachers and, and it has been qualitatively given to us. So handwriting, the regarding teachers are just like, we are so excited that we have explicit instruction in handwriting. Um, and it starts from the ground up. So it's, you know, how do you hold a pencil? How do you draw a line? How do you, and so this really seems simplistic, but it actually has really helped students be able to demonstrate their writing. Uh, so teachers are finding that in kindergarten, kids are actually able to start demonstrating their writing just in stronger ways than they have before because of this explicit instruction. So we're liking that. The K2 read alouds are going really well. Um, that's during the knowledge portion. That's uh, a teacher reading to students. There's no text. Uh, there are images or picture cards, and kids are looking at the images while teachers read. Um, and this we heard actually teachers are really excited about the read alouds. It's been challenging because it takes a while to build this into stamina. Uh, kids don't just naturally sit there in first grade for 25 minutes um, from the onset, but what we've seen is that over time they are building stamina and confidence. So we've had like more than one like, lots of teachers come in and say, this is really exciting because a lot of our kiddos that aren't necessarily strong readers yet or haven't like they they're not decoding yet, but then you get them in that read aloud and they're making connections like this and they're like outshining their peers. And if you're a kiddo that's just purely like your only opportunity in class is to shine with reading, well, then you don't shine very often. But this is this read aloud time and really building their listening comprehension and that oral listening skill has been going really well. Uh, they're also drawing from that a lot of rich content, uh, vocabulary, they're using book vocabulary like outside of class time in different settings and contexts. And teachers are just really excited that it's so neat to get the digital components are going well. Teachers are using those. Uh, overall, we're liking them. We've had a couple of tech hiccups with uh, the accessing the digital components, but um, overall, for year one, we're happy about that. The CITs seem to be going fairly well. I don't say fairly, that's an under um, statement, but they are going well. We're getting feedback that they're useful. M class and Lempura Dibbles assessment. We are talking consistently with Harvey Clark and with Joseph Gale. And, uh, looking at how they're implementing the pilot and feedback as far as what we need to tweak and we're happy with that so far. We also have been getting some really good um, feedback as far as the K2 Spanish skills and I know I've had some conversations with Lauren and also about this that the Spanish skills is actually designed to provide systematic instruction of the Spanish language. It's not a direct translation of English. It actually follows the structure and then Spanish. And so we're really excited about that. That was something that was really important to us. And so far, um, it's proven to be very reliable. One other thing I wanted to mention, uh, M Class and Montura just released a new feature called the Dyslexia Indicator. But basically, uh, what it does is it screens kiddos more precisely if they uh, don't perform, um, if they perform significantly lower within rapid reading, letter sound, and word reading fluency. Um, and with that indicator, it actually pops up on the report. And we have this feature for the English and Spanish now assessment. And so we can, before that was really something that was more tailored for the English assessment and provided for English and Spanish now. So we're really excited about that. It by no means is any kind of diagnosis or um, identifier, but it it is. An indicator that students may be having various factors associated with dyslexia, and so it just gives us another data point. Um, we're still, though, talking through how do you look at various points of data and not just that point of data, especially with our emergent high people. Uh, we have to keep the context of it may not necessarily be a written factor associated with the learning disability or just destroying the reader. It could be something where the student simply has not had enough. In that language. So we're really uh, trying to 
analyze that further to make sure that the guidance that we give next year really does benefit students. Does that, does that start with um, kindergarten? Does it give you an indication that the student may be No, not maybe dyslexic. May show dyslexic. Okay. So, what are teachers asking for more support in? Generally speaking, I mean, I could fill pages, but just in general, this, these are the big buckets. Formative and summative assessments. Just haven't had a lot of time yet to get into the use of them yet. We have a building sequence, we have guidelines as far as here are priority, formative, and summative. Here are things that use your own judgment as far as if you have time or if it matches, you know, if it, it meets the needs of the kids that are in your class. Um, but it's complex. The curriculum is complex. It's not just, it's not as straightforward as necessarily uh, maybe you're used to with. Um, I don't know the math curriculum or Pearson. So uh, we're, we need, we know that we need to provide more guidance on that, and we are trying through different avenues to provide them more guidance on that. I think the I think the help the really helpful stuff will come next fall. We just didn't know enough this fall to be able to provide some really strong concrete stuff. So we can just provide like a guidance framework to say this is what we see, and this you know follow this as best we can, give us what we need. And as we're learning more about the units, we're starting to be able to say okay. These summative, yes. These formative, yes. But these formative, maybe that's an exposure to the versus a proficiency skill. And so it's starting to map that out for teachers. Amplify reading, that is the adaptive skill app. And it gives you some really good information to help inform instruction. So teachers are been asking for some more information on how to use that effectively. So, what is that? Elena? Amplify Reading is an online uh, digital app for kids with adaptive skills practice. And that's a little, because it's set up like a game, it's almost set up like a game. And so kids go through these quests and put it skills, adaptive skills practice. And so as they master a skill and become proficient, then they can move them on to a different game. Kids really like it, but it's also truly based on skills. And so it gives you a lot of really good information as far as what what sounds are kids learning? What sounds are they are they still not are they are they able to blend certain combinations? Are they being able to blend their species? So many things. So uh, it gives a lot of good information. It's just teachers having time to understand and figure it out. Okay, so real quick, what is your plan for giving teachers more information on these last few things? The assessments and the amplifier data. You're saying that they're lacking some information and more details. What's your guys' plan to get that information? Our yeah, so we've already given them information in in well formative and summative we gave information at the beginning of the year. It kind of depends on what the SIT request is, and that's where we form our topics. We provided additional uh, times outside of uh, contract, which is not really something I would count. The amplify reading and the formative assessments, amplify reading on the 27th is not going to be addressed as much, but formative assessments, scaffolds for the core, and 30 minute intervention outside of core will all be used to provide on the on the of January. So we're going to bring back and revisit. We try if we can, we try to bring this PD to the SIP, but if teachers in that survey are saying like that's not their immediate request, then we try to be responsive to what they say they need in the moment. But these are still like big picture things that continue to come up. At the end of the day, I always tell teachers, if you need help with one of these things, please reach out to a coach and they'll come and meet with you one on one as much as you need to pro you know to provide clarity and or support into what this could look like. Um, so it's just a matter of trying to get into building, trying to get as much time in during the meetings that we can, and then trying to have coaches work with teachers one on one, but have to be one on to have to be all in. So for the PD on the 27th, is that gonna be for all elementary yeah. teachers? Yes, and it'll be what how many hours did you get everybody on this? Uh, we're doing three sessions. One of them needed to be for math because of the new work sample requirements. So we have two sessions. So basically, it's like a rotation: A two, A five, and then English, English only, and then dual language. And so they're rotating sessions. One of the sessions is going to be on small group and how to plan accordingly for that, and then the other one is going to be on planning itself. And part of that will include scaffolds. We've done quite a bit of scaffolds during core instruction in, in SIP, but you can really only get into a SIP maybe once every other month. And the assessment part would be in that PD also? 
The assessment so you're saying when you first started talking about it about now understanding more fine details, mm -hmm. like which assessments are working or not. So is that yeah. going to be incorporated into your PD? Um. Yes. I would not say the formative and summit. They're going to be introduced in the lesson planning session because because the PD is. Uh, developed so that they start with their summative and they plan backwards and we're going to have them do the next unit not the unit they're currently in so they will learn how to plan it oh they will have to know how to plan a unit based on backwards play and they'll have to look at that assessment and then backwards plan and look at how those formatives are intertwined so will we necessarily be able to sit down and walk through every formative assessment assessment for the for the whole year with them no but we'll be able to model and have them practice planning a whole unit with formative and summatives in mind that's great. Will you guys be able to follow up with them after? But when that unit's done, do you know, it was working for them or not working for them? Or? I hope so. If they allow us to come in their classrooms. <laughs> I mean, I can always do walkthroughs as much as I want. The coaches, you know, they don't go in and observe in that way. Um, but or just a survey or yeah, I, or I think there's a, another. I know Narcy has a question too. But there's this kind of a long-term conversation for us, which is going into next year. There's still a PD need. And so we may need to be talking about as we head into the budget about how to get um, folks some more PD time going into this year. This year we um, expanded, I think it was two days. We had an extra two days of PD that we gave. Um, we might need to be talking about that again of how to, in the beginning of the year, is really the best time for us to kind of load up some PD, but that just again another kind of conversation for us. Yeah, I just wanted to make the most of the program and the things that things come up. Yeah, there's kind of, you know, there's a rather of our coaches have really, really, really dive into the curriculum. I mean I'm I'm impressed at how how much into their grade for their grade bands. They have a lot of knowledge around it, even when you amplify some of the amplify the you guys Bob, you guys know more sometimes more than we do. Um, the hard thing is, is that we really want to be responsive to what the teachers are saying that they want and need for their sit. And so we may know that these things are coming on the horizon. So we're trying to balance, like, how can we try and do both? Knowing that we're only going to get one hour with them maybe every other month if we're lucky. So that's why we also try to offer some other options for teachers that are um, asking for help. I have a question. Yeah. I'm um like this particular image quantum monopoly. Um is this for what age level? Is this for kinder, first, second? It's uh hey six. So and I assume that like this image is already signed within what was projected around. Was it looked at as, I'm just wondering what reaction a child would have with just the warning for unlawful belief, unlawful, breaking the law, you know, the sensitivity of it, and what um, may be internalized about that is, I, at least I'm thinking about this as a parent or as a person of um, unlawful reading, or even just some of the look out you see. Uh, the other one I heard was the um, at risk, you know, for the dyslexic potential children. So I'm just wondering what that may be doing to the child psychologically about looking at. Is that image part of the curriculum? That, that is on the. That is on the a because the game is a, is kind of oh. set up like a video game, so to speak. Right. And so that I think I haven't played all the games for all the grade levels, but I believe this is like the starting of a quest, and they go out and um, they take on different skills or whatnot to acquire reading. We can look at that. Yeah, I, yeah, I just get concerned. I'm like, I would want my grandchild to be able to read. There has to be a strength strength based model mm -hmm. versus unwanted. Wanted for an unlawful reading. I mean, but is this a criminal activity going on here? <laughs> I know, but we can take a look at that. I don't think I have an answer, or we don't have an answer. Right yeah, now. I haven't gotten, I haven't gotten any message that he's not there. So yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just going to be sending messages to the kids that are not lost. Yeah. Okay. 
right? Okay, so challenges. So these are some of the bigger challenges that we're hearing. Uh, planning, planning has been tough. Uh, the curriculum is new. So even before you sit down with a plan, you really have to read through the unit and read through each lesson and understand okay, uh, and read through uh, what is the purpose? Uh, why am I assessing? What am I assessing when? And then really taking into account the grade level. So we're having to take an account like who are my multilingual learners, who are my uh, kiddos that are receiving special education, who are my kids that are below grade level, and what kind of scaffolds am I going to have to invest so that they can access grade level content. So the planning has been, I know that it's been a learning curve uh, or an adjustment, I guess I would say, uh, because it is new, there is so much pre-reading before they sit down the plan. And so this is a big piece that we're embedding in the January 27th. Uh, because we've consistently heard that this is something that teachers would like more support in. The pacing, we didn't, you know, we got off not on the best foot with the late material arrival. So our pacing was already set back initially, but of course, anytime you're teaching something brand new, it's just going to take you longer and put you on it. So our pacing, we're definitely trying to work on that. We're trying to, uh, we're, time, we're, we're talking to the teachers, the, the understanding that really looking to those summatives and the formatives and really understanding what skills students will be expected to show proficiency in and which ones just are an exposure. Because if you teach every little thing to mastery, you're never gonna get through this. You're never gonna get through the content. And the wonderful thing about this curriculum is that it does spiral and builds on it, it builds. So the skills that you see in uh, unit one will show up in unit two and unit three and unit four. So it's not it's not like you teach it and then you completely move on. So there's additional there's additional times to reteach. Another challenge has been grade level instruction and materials in the core. I mean we have kiddos, you know, a portion of kids that are not at grade level. And so this is a big challenge teaching grade level curriculum in the core. Previously to this, either we created our own curriculum or we uh, differentiated it during course. So if you're below grade level, you would be in this group and you would be, would be learning this grade level curriculum. And if you're at grade level, you'd be in this group. And now everyone's together accessing grade level core. So that's a good thing, but it's challenging. So we're trying to work with teachers to see how they to, to help them kind of understand how to make that doable. So it's just in the second grade class in today, and they did a fantastic job. All second graders are reading the grade level text, but some are reading the pen group, some are reading the partner, and then there was a small group in the back that was reading the teacher. But they were all reading the second grade readers, even though many of them are not at second grade level. So that's really that was very insane to me. And time for intervention outside of the core. So not so much a challenge for our non-dual language schools, but for our dual language schools, because they have um, the wonderful uh, element of double literacy that also then reduces the amount of time you have for intervention outside of four. So that is something that we're trying to figure out how to problem solve with them. We're trying to learn how that works best. So I'm really confident that next fall we'll have something solid. So what is the second half of the year? What is it like? We are going to be working on aligning the report cards now that we know what kids are expected to um, demonstrate learning on. We can start to align our report cards pre K five. We're also going to be working more to align our dual language models so that it aligns with our literacy curriculum. And that Laura has a big part in that. We're going to be pulling together, and I think okay, this is um, probably where this will also come into. We needed to wait until teachers had at least taught a couple of units to be able to speak to what they're seeing and in the curriculum, but we're going to be pulling together a committee to talk through how culture responsive are the materials and the instruction. Where can we improve? Where can we enhance? Where do we not see the perspectives or the voices at the table that we want when we're talking about this topic or teaching about this event? So that's going to be the second half of the year. We're continuing to monitor M class and Matura. I really would love to be able to budget for our group letters so far. I don't have any of the expectations that we can do a huge group, but I know that there are teachers that have asked me. I would love to do letters, get letters started. It is a two year educational program, like they mentioned. So it's not necessarily something that's going to fit everyone, but it's really not exceptional. The coaches and I are just finishing the first year of it um, this spring. 
and it really is um, it's really good stuff. We're going to continue to assess our pre-K benchmark assessment. We're piloting that this year, and in a couple months, uh, we'll start to talk about whether or not we feel like it brings us the data that we want, or if we may need to look at other things. And then we're also going to finish our sixth grade Spanish literacy pilot, which is amplified science. Okay. Yep. Is there is there a time frame? Yeah. So the challenges. Yeah. Yeah. Because you know, being in this for a long time, it seems like I hear the same, you know, kind of dialogue when you're beginning on a program. And it, when you sit down, do you have a clear like a year plan, a two-year plan? You know, as a leadership group about uh, where you're going, kind of meeting with the end mind, and then, then backwards planning to make sure that we get these improve some of those challenge areas. I mean, are we having that dialogue between the coaches and you and the teachers? Is that going on? Because sometimes you get going so fast, you don't have time for that. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yes. It's, higher level planning. Yeah, it's, I wouldn't say that that higher level plan is happening necessarily with me and the coaches, but I'd say that's happening with the services with and I. Uh, so with the coaches, I feel like it's chilling an onion. You know, every week, like for example, pre K, we had a conversation the other day about our benchmark assessment in the pilot. We had a conversation around, okay, but wait, we need to step back and make sure, like, what are our goals for pre K? What do we want them to be able to do by the end of pre K? Well, wait, now we have a new curriculum in kindergarten, so let's look at the alignment of kindergarten. What are they supposed to, what do they need to know in order to, you know, go into kindergarten ready to do literacy in kindergarten? So it's kind of like, that's kind of like where we start to uncover all of the things that we really need to have, like the nuances of how deep this goes. But I would say system-wise, those are the conversations that John, myself, Dave, and Kathy, we're all having as far as, and I think that's our MTSS framework that we're trying to build those systems. Um, and so these are pieces of it, but yeah, these are really details. It's not the bigger picture. Yeah, I guess do we have benchmarks about where we want to be at certain times, or well, the interesting thing here is right now we have so many different assessments that we're using. The this K6 um, M class lecture gives us the first time where we can actually test across all of our schools and know kind of how kids are doing in all of the different schools and, and not have scar in them. You know, the IAP. So actually, we're headed towards a system where we can actually, some of this will make sense. Um, but to say we have a benchmark now, I would say that's really hard because we still have three or four different assessments that we're trying to measure um, student performance. I know we do have about the draft so we have the timeline in place and check back to see if it's right here. Mm -hmm. I guess that's what I'm asking. So it's just being gone through this so many times at the different levels, just making sure that we're checking the timelines. I would say 14% this is what we've always been seeing in terms of MTSS and how the technical play is through. So, so I'll take you back and I'll let answer. So, looking at, you know, in 10 years, so the kids out here, in 10 years, are we expecting them to be at grade level? You know, kids that need intervention? You know, because you know, I, I, I always go back to Neil Armstrong, how far behind is our Neil Armstrong? So, one of the goals I think of is that by the time it gets to the Neil Armstrong or Tom um, Hall, will they have, will we have more kids than we have like 50% of the kids being straight going? Will we have 75% of the kids being straight going? In two years, three years, four years? Is that part of your plan? Yes, um, we have a district wide uh, consolidated on what we discuss of the instead of 10% of the local on that. 
mesh model. That's what's going to be helpful. We're, we're, as I explained before, there's some real calibration projects. Um, the new shorter decimal test. But, um, and then we're looking at three year, three percent more, and that three percent more, and talk about that. But we're having the same conversations in terms of like math intervention. We have those math intervention classes that we put in at middle school, but could they be better utilized as to pull out to be like we were before? And then how do we spread those two back to the among six schools? That would be two schools per teacher. Again, those interventions, two or three, supports even lower. That's exactly what we're talking about. But what do you do for the you know seventh and eighth graders to eat that? Um, so that they're prepared so that when they hit high school credits, they can go ahead and attain those credits graduation. So we are, I mean, we're right in the middle of um, this winter of that we'll get our first indication kind of where where kids are at and um, what kind of growth we're making. We're making growth because of, again, there's no way that we could not be making growth. It's, you know that. Right, yeah. exactly. Um, I think the other piece that just anecdotally that I'm looking at because I don't have that, I don't, we don't have that data yet is the fact that this program is so much again more focused on explicit construction and phonics. We know from research that the more at risk a student is or behind, the more that they need that instruction. The other thing that you said earlier is, is that all kids are getting grade level instruction, whether they're at grade level or not, that's a change um, in the curriculum. That should be leading to better outcomes for us. We're about to find out. Um, again, there's implementation difference. So yeah. um, as we're as we're working new programs, often things go down before they go up. But I really, I don't know. We're going to find out here by the end of February is when we'll have our winter benchmarking done, and we'll be able to put out some some data for folks and you can say where we're at. But um, also, I don't want to I, I don't want to understate. We've had a significant problem receiving materials that were promised to us. Yeah, and we've been working hard to amplify. Uh, we were waiting on components to put up. Yeah, so, so I mean, that's great level core instructional materials. So, um, we're taking that into consideration as well. So, one of the things I think about is the assessment across the elementary level, everybody's doing the same assessment. Then, if you see a school or a grade level that is not making progress. You have the coaches to go in and support that person, and the principal, and and so it's not like these kids get further behind. There's a team that will. This is my interpretation. There's a team in there to say, okay, look, we need a little bit of help here, you know. Um, and and I think that's great because then what happens if everybody's growing and making progress? We're not going to have the issues that we had in town hall. So we do have active PLCs. I thought that earlier establishing active PLC teachers, grade A through uh, four, and every school you know, sort of they can work together supporting the teams and having those ongoing discussions at that tier one, making sure all students have that access, as well as what kind of tier two supports are we intentionally planning together um, at our school for that. So um, this this is only building the foundation in terms of support, and then that aligning um, that coherence of one math um, assessment, which will, will be K for and now shortly the pilot uh, in a couple of weeks, and then this M class M class will put a um, K instead. We'll still have star so seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. That just in time, you know, monitoring this M class and M class A twelve only go up to six grades. Um, we're we're very excited about that. Our teachers are asking for one and both the literacy and the uh, math that we're looking at either um, our dual language specialists, um, Spanish literacy specialists are very excited about the quality. Um, it'll be that much more informative to support instruction. Real time, the classroom. 
So our goal is 80%. That's, I mean, that's been our goal under our TFS framework. It has been our goal under our API is 80% of our kids are able to ever attain that. I don't think we're ever going to attain that until we get to one. And my hope would be that, my hope would be that by the end of next year, all teachers and all students have access to perfected grade level instruction material. That is first and foremost, is the preventative. And when you look at that and you think about that, like especially for students who are seven readers or who are at risk for risk factors associated with dyslexia, like I know you've talked about, it's early intervention. Right, you can catch them before you fall, and that's really what I think it's all well about. So until we start doing this well, we're not going to get the results that we want because we can't like continuously catch up. So we, we can respond to like dips in the data, but it's not going to really fix the system wide problem. The system wide problem is tier one. So this is the goal for the reason next year. This is this is this is the goal that we start. Yeah, we have everything we need now to start off. Okay, so tier one, so just in general, how does the adoption connect with MTSS? That's our that's our core instruction and materials. Tier two is the reteaching or the pre-teaching, and that's also in the core materials that we have purchased through the adoption. So we have that support as well. And then Kate, like you asked about, we are um, with the pilots, we are observing and monitoring how verse how that diverse is. So we're really hoping. Um, that that works, or we, we need to make sure that it's intensive for some of our students that are um, at that highest level of need for reading intervention. So we're, we're still wanting to make sure that that works. Then we've got the screener, like uh, John talked about. Um, we've got our 100% and 20% means that we're still trying to kind of just improve that process so that we've got database problem solving. It's the discussion and the focus on instruction that we're still trying to uh, make sure that's a key point of those meetings. We've got progress monitoring that we know that we are going to be able to fine tune and align more next year with our new M class and Ventura assessment uh, software or I guess platform. And then we've also been working this year already with principals to look at their master schedule and talk about. Okay, we said that literacy is a priority. We said core is a priority. Does your master schedule reflect that? We said that intervention outside the core is important. Does your master schedule reflect that? Why or why not? We've got to talk through what we need to figure out this year so that next fall we can start off with a master schedule that reflects our priority. So that is good. Yep. Um, yeah. Got it. Oh, well, thank you. Yeah, just a lot of information. Yeah, yeah, perfect. Perfect. I think we can head into our, start making our transition. All right, so we'll uh, do a close the session. It's like green.
All right, we'll get started here. Um, oh, the January 23rd, 2023 Forest Grove School District Board of Directors meeting. Uh, call it to order at 6.30 p.m. The roll call of board members present, uh, Mark Everett, Chair present. Roger Farrell, Vice Chair present. Jack of the present. Hey, Vincent, present. Dollar Ingram, Susan <laughs> Thank you, everybody. We'll uh, start the class with you. Pledge of allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Right, quick introduction of audience and staff. If we can, uh, we can start right here. We have Beverly Cornelius. Yeah. David Warner, communications. John O'Neill, assistant superintendent. Uh, Marie Vignon, technology department. I think Luke, business. Cynthia Shue, business. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, approval of tonight's agenda. There a motion to approve uh, the agenda for this evening. So moved. Second. And we can second it. So uh, roll call vote. I, uh, I'm a yes. Brad? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Um, let's see. Student rep report. I got a long one. Okay. okay. All right. Great. Um, uh, um, our jam and gym is actually this Friday. We haven't pushed out that much information about it yet, but our theme is neon. Um, the girls are playing at 5.45, and then the boys are playing at 7. Um, swimming senior night and wrestling senior night are this Thursday. Swimming is at 3.30, and wrestling is at 7. Um, our sparrow update. Uh, we did have our assembly. It went really well. Um, all the kids seem to enjoy it, and they're actually, like, very... It was a community setting, so it was very nice for everyone. Um, we do have, so with Sparrow, they do um, donate their hours, so they do volunteer hours, and then that will turn into money, and so that's being pushed out this week, um, and then I'm getting a link to for direct donations to the family. Um, LA, which is our listeners in action, um, they have a winter formal, and that is February 11th, so pretty soon. Um, Renaissance Rack Week is during Valentine's Week, so that will be fun. Um, and then we have some new, um, or sorry, our clubs are trying to promote more. Um, and so Karen has, or Miss O'Neill, sorry, Miss O'Neill has been um, very nice and has has given us a portion of the money, um, and we'll give that to teachers as like I think or like uh, for them helping with clubs and running some clubs. Um, other than that, we do have some new course elective offerings next semester, um, wildland firefighting, um, film, video production, and then personal finance. So those will all be fun for some people to enjoy. Um, other than that, I think that's it. I don't know if there's any questions, but yeah. So can you, can you say again the, the three class, I heard personal yeah. finance. Uh, wildland firefighting. We all, we already have a firefighting. I want to say course where we go to uh, the Forest Pro like actual fire department. I'm pretty sure, right. and that's kind of the PCC. Um, I'm not sure exactly what this is tied with, but it's wildland firefighting and then film and video production. So a lot of students have wanted that, and so that's been a push in that field. And then yeah, personal finance. Oh, nice. So those should be courses, or they're actually done during your uh, uh, activity period. But it's, so yeah, those will actually be new courses. Um, Mr. Burke, he did send an email. Um, I'm not sure about like what was or the result of the um, Google form, but it was an interest kind of thing, and so those will be in there. I'm pretty sure. So. I'm, yeah, I'm pretty happy about the personal finance course. Yeah. I, mean, right. I don't know. I just think that's a great course for. Uh, it's it, in the old days they had it, and then it went away, and now it's, it's come back. And, I, I'm, and, and the and the firefighting and the video course too. So 
it's great. I'm just curious how that works though, because like my kids got their schedules for semester one and semester two at the beginning of the year. So when you add courses in the middle of the year, right. how does anybody sign up for it or how does the schedule get changed? You have to drop. I guess they, they would have to go in. It seems like it'll be a schedule. Like, schedule. I mean, it kind of is so much, but also like if you think about it, a lot of kids do like choose to change a lot of their classes at semester, I know, um, or drop classes too. So having that option to add that class during, and during certain like periods, do I know they need some too? So that would be good. We'll also check. Yeah, those are good questions. Though. Okay, thank you. All right. Well, uh, here. Perfect. Um, superintendent comment. So, January is School Board Appreciation Month. We want to take this time to thank our board members Mark, Mark Edward, Brad Farrell, Kate Vandusky, Valerie Ingram, and Marce Rodriguez for the counts of countless volunteer hours they spend doing what's best for our, to serve our children. Our board members are local citizens who are friends and neighbors with extraordinary dedication to our students. They serve as advisors, decision makers, problem solvers, and advocates for each student in the Forest Grove School District. As volunteers, they put in many hours at meetings, probably more than anybody wants, but lots of hours in meetings in schools, in our communities. Each member contributes his or own strengths to our district. These different contributions and pers uh, perspectives make them a formidable group, and these different uh, perspectives actually strengthen their capacity as a board. Um, they're able to navigate their differences, pick up on each other's perspectives, and ultimately arrive at the best possible outcome for all of our students and our school district. I feel very fortunate um, having worked with this board for five years, so I appreciate. I know you're giving up time that you could be spending with other things, but I just know how important. I've watched what's going on in other parts of Oregon, and I'm very, um, very happy with that. Uh, we're very fortunate to have such a dedicated group of individuals who are working hard on a daily basis. Um, even though we are making special effort during January to show appreciation for you, we recognize this is a year-round job and appreciate all that you do. So you've got, in front of you, you've got Little things given from different parts of the organization. Fernhill, I love the um, pre K, um, there's some different grade levels, but a little thank you. What I love about pre K is I see some actual letters and numbers. So uh, <laughs> that is awesome. Um, again, just want to take and thank you for all your hard work and appreciate what you do for our, for our community. And the pies are from the pie guys. Okay, good. Oh, sure. um, strategic planning, we've spent the last few months, really since we passed the law, um, doing quite a bit of outreach. Um, during late November, December, January, we've surveyed um, students. We've sent them several different climate surveys. We've gone out, we've um, done the high school has done more than 300 empathy interviews with students, finding out what's working, what's not. Um, we also did another 100 um, students through um, through Oz and his group of, um, of folks. We've got 40 um, parent empathy interviews. We've um, just pushed out more information to our folks, kind of talking about how our district is doing. All of that data is coming back, and the reason I bring it up is we're just about to start a strategic planning process. We're going to meet three times. Um, the design team will meet um, January 31st, March 7th, and May 9th um, to come together. It'll be similar to what you'll see, you've seen us do before with kind of a strength, weaknesses, uh, opportunities a SWOT analysis, and then starting to kind of dig into what we think our strategic aims are. There will also be teams working in between those meetings to kind of do the work so that we can bring, there's about 50 folks on the design team, so it's a good selection, diverse uh, different parents and staff and, uh, and kids. So that is going, Brad and Mark are serving on that committee as kind of the board's representatives. and. Um, I'm just excited to finally kind of get going on this so we can come.
come out of this with a, um, a strong plan of how we head into next year. Um, Hall of Fame, I think I'm going to talk Jam to Jam is this Friday where they'll introduce the Hall of Fame folks. And then Saturday night at Pumpkin Ridge, they are doing the Hall of Fame dinner. Um, I know I'm headed and it should be I've gone to the last, well, we canceled a couple because of uh, COVID, but this will this will be fun to get back together again and celebrate some of our um, graduates or older graduates. <laughs> Um, lastly, I want to just talk about on, um, oops, yeah, that's good. That was Jen and Jen, so I kind of, you talked about that too, so, um, lastly, just want to talk about on Thursday night from, um, 5.30 to 7.30, we're having the first, uh, Cornelius Open House. Um, it's kind of the architects have planned kind of an activity, we'll serve dinner, we'll have some, they're doing like a movie night for the kids. And then the parents and um, community members who want to kind of learn more about the process and learn how to get involved, they'll run them through. They'll actually also take some feedback about what they like about Cornelius, what they like about the school, or some things that we want to make sure that we uh, are memorialized. And that will take place on Thursday, January 26th from 5.30 to 7.30. And um, we went through the activity with the architects today. It was really fun. Kate is going to be representing the board on the design committee once it gets. Um, we're, I don't know if I, we have the first date for that yet, but it'll be kind of after it'll this open house in February. Yeah. So we'll, um, we'll get going on that part of it. But um, it's often rolling. They held the first couple of focus groups. So we've got different focus groups that we're bringing in to hear more about what's important. Um, the two that they brought in today a really great, interesting feedback around uh, the community resource um, center and what it serves for the um, for that community. So again, things are off and rolling. It's pretty exciting. And that's it for comments. Did I forget anything, Kathy? I got, I got one thing that we forgot about. The Unified Basketball Saturday. Yeah, we, we forgot about that one. And they could use volunteers, and even if you can't volunteer, you could go and watch and support. It'd be great. Um, what's the time on that? I think it's like eight all to four or something. Or all day, all day, yeah, yeah. It's all day, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Anyway, um, unscheduled public appearance. Uh, the board appreciates community members sharing information during the public comments. Public comments will be made in person or submitted to the designated forum on the web page, be read by district staff or registered Zoom participants who indicated through the forum they wanted to provide their comment live. Public comments will be limited to three minutes, as is the protocol for board meetings. Public criticism or complaints about school district personnel are not allowed at this time. Are there any public comments? No. Um, we move on to the consent agenda. Uh, the consent agenda is made up of routine non controversial items to be voted on under one motion. Are there any items within the consent items board member and superintendent wishes to discuss that? I move that we approve the consent agenda as presented. Second. Okay. Okay. okay, moved and seconded. Uh, we'll do a roll call vote. Say and then yes. Kate? Okay. Yes. Marcy? Yes. Donald? Yes. And Brad? Yes. Motion passes. We move on to uh, the presentation. Two presentations this evening. The first one is a uh, uh, audit report from uh, Mr. David Bledsoe, Holly Rogers, and associates, and I think he'll join us virtually. Good evening, can you hear me? Wonderful. Uh, thank you for having me this evening. Uh, as the introduction, my name is David Bledsoe with Paul Rogers and Associates. I've been the senior auditor with the Forest Grove School District Audit for the past two years and work in the file for the past three audit cycles. I'm happy to report again, we had another strong audit year. 
we noted only two instances of really anything to discuss. Number one is during all the shuffles during 2020, there was a couple uh, expenditure items that slightly sit over the budgetary amounts. Um, the second is one instance of a teacher's experience being underreported by one year. After digging through some payroll archives, we discovered that this related all the way back to, I believe, the mid-90s, um, and it was limited to one instance. We saw no further instances of noncompliance in that area. Some financial highlights this year. This year saw the implementation of Gatsby's statement number 87. This is a pretty big ticket item for us and really changed the way that leases are evaluated and disclosed within the financial statements. In short, this moved leases from a note in the back that people occasionally read to really a big ticket item that affects both net position as well as uh, the reconciliations between the government-wide, which are more reflective of day-to-day -day operations, and the modified accrual, which is you're going to be in net position in activities. In addition, this year saw a pretty sharp decrease in the net PERS pension liability. This was due to uh, a myriad of factors, most notably the increase in value of assets held in trust to pay um, actuarially defined PERS pension obligations long term. That is to say, the value of investments rose sharply when the market went up uh, and, and outpaced the increase in projected costs. This may end up coming down during the next fiscal year, as these reports are laggard by about one year. So strong market returns in 2021 will be offset by less strong returns in 2022. Um, these amounts in net position and activities do tend to swing year over year, depending on these market conditions, and are not necessarily reflective of really business operations for the district. Those uh, reference points are better looked at on the government-wide, as we call it, or pages three and five of the financial report. In addition to GASB 87 being implemented this year, and I want to commend the uh, business office staff, as they were the only district I've worked on that correctly implemented both lease and leasor activity, including the myriad of journal entries behind them. Next year has an equally tumultuous and large GASB pronouncement. That's GASB number 96. This is qualitatively very similar to 87, but instead of looking at things like printers and leases of buildings and trucks, you have to evaluate software subscription leases. So this is everything from Windows licenses, security cameras, um, anything like that. This will be another kind of big ticket item that will be shown both on that position and the reconciliation pages and will take a, a significant amount of uh, staff time and investment. Other than that, during our audit this year, we focused uh, in addition on compliance with general accounting rules and GAP and GASB. We also looked at the Student Success Act funded student investment accounts, noting no areas of noncompliance there. And for a single audit this year, we focused on migrant education and ESSER. Um, I'm happy to report clean as a whistle across both of those items as well. Uh, happy, happy to answer any questions that the board may have. Um, mm -hmm. you might have just covered it. So, you might have to have a view. Here. Oh, I didn't have it. Um, I think, um, I guess it's safe. I have six or seven on. Under the current info, so the resources, the pension, which I think it's on um, it's numeral seven under deferred inflows of resources, pension, and OPED. Mm -hmm. So it was under 2021, it was 4.8 million, and then under 2022, it was 36 million. Mm -hmm. So uh, speaking broadly, the deferred inflows and outflows are essentially just reflections of what an actuary may think projected future costs will be to cover any kind of healthcare costs for planned participants for the district. Uh, it's essentially an assumption about what, how long district uh, participants will live, what their medical costs would be, inflation rate, return rates. 
increases in both plan costs as well as market returns on plan assets. These numbers tend to swing pretty wildly year to year because they do have so many items kind of flowing into them. The costs are also offset by returns in uh, net assets held in trust to pay those, as well as any kind of contributions the district makes um, in and above those statutorily required amounts. So those numbers can kind of swing irrespective of really the day-to-day -day operations. Specifically for these, um, other items that went into it include uh, changes in the actuarially defined assumptions for that OPEB plan. Um, happy to draw on about this as long as you wish, but it's uh, not the most exciting topic we could discuss this evening. I just have one. Every year we talk, how, do, how does this audit compare to other districts in our area? Pardon, can you repeat that? How does this audit compare to other districts in our area of similar sizes? Yeah, this audit went uh, very smoothly as far as other districts of size. The accounting staff is uh, particularly rigorous at Forest Grove. I will, I will commend them on that. The GAS 87 standard is um, very complicated, and they were one of the districts kind of spearheading both uh, booking the entries on their end, as well as not having us necessarily unwind and re-put those entries in there. So the uh, compared to similar size districts, uh, very strong. Thank you. Hey, no other questions. I think uh, thank you very much. Thank you for having this evening. Hey, our second uh, presentation is the portrait of a graduate. Uh, John, I'm going to speak to that. Yes, sir. That's fine. You want to get that button? No. Thank you, David. So on November 28th, the board might recall that I came forward with a project that Putting together a portrait of graduate. Um, we had some samples that you could look at um, that were left up in the boardroom. Um, and tonight I'm bringing you, and I just handed it out um, to you. Um, we had a, quite an extensive developmental process, which included our entire district administrative team in two formal meetings. District level coordinators, district level teachers on assignments, representing curriculum instruction and student services. Um, we intentionally collected um, all stakeholder feedback in the thought exchange to identify those six traits or six outcomes that we want our students to be able to achieve. Um, when upon graduation, we want them to be a collaborative, we want them to be resilient. Want them to be responsible, empathetic, critical thinker, and communicate. But the heavy lifting in this work was putting together those phrases um, for each of those for a quick reference, in addition to a more in depth bullet display for each of those traits and areas to further refine and communicate what she, which each trait meant. This is targeted so that our students that are in third grade on up can read it and understand what we're talking about, as well as all stakeholders, all parents in our community. And this will be once um, it goes through this process, we'll, we're, we're working on getting the Spanish version as well. We'll have that. And then we're gonna go ahead and disseminate it to all of our principals to share with their staff and the upcoming staff meeting, get their feedback, Look at parents again, their building site councils, etc. Um, and then uh, also uh, student groups, particularly at the high school, um, ASB, etc. Um, what we're looking for is obviously we want the academic skill set they need, but in the 21st century, they need these skills 
that we've identified, and this was directly from our parent feedback, our stakeholder feedback. And as you recall, we had 90% of our teachers um, when we surveyed uh, provided that feedback. So um, I want to give a big shout out also to Forest Grove High School graphics arts teacher, um, Shannon Kirkman, and her students who helped provide input and rough draft, and they made multiple iterations of this. Um, and it's been amazing. So um, it aligns with our prior work, our current work, and our future work. And it also integrates our um, in an understandable, accessible language for our social emotional learning, for avid strategies, our equity work, um, and others. So um, again, we're looking for multiple points of entry for all our stakeholders. So you will see this and understand you know, what we're shooting for um, years uh, to go. It's also very intentional, this timeline, that we're coming out to you now to get your feedback and support or um, any suggestions for revision um, so that uh, we can utilize this in our strategic planning efforts. The Help for Kids helped us you know, with this. That's kind of their um, work. They also work with districts. Once we have this as our North Star, our district vision, for going forward with our kids um, at all levels in the system um, with our strategic planning efforts. So um, we're looking excited for that. And we're also looking at the budgeting process, you know, putting this in front of our budgeting committee and saying these are, you know, what we're going to fund and focus on in addition to the just core academic um, reading, writing, arithmetic, science, social studies, and uh, enriched um, CTE program. Any questions? Mercy. Hi, Mallory. Um, this looks great. I just have a quick question. Um, I like the images of all the themes, but what's the resilient? What is that? Oh my goodness. I don't know if you've heard it. No, you may ask as a way to But we are we. We've made one switch already, and that's what we ended up with. So we'll we'll talk about that some more. Oh, okay, yeah, that's just doesn't make sense um, to me. <laughs> um, okay. What's funny is that's the new image. And um, so the first one might be even more like this. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So, so we're working on that. And so we also wanted the gender neutral. <laughs> <laughs> so I mean, you know what I mean. <laughs> I'm on the you wait but yes, that's a work in process. Oh um, I will also say John kind of mentioned it, but um we have SEL standards and we have avid standards. We actually did a crosswalk of all of those to make sure that the language in those standards is also here. So the work that we've already been doing for is is represented in these words. And there was uh, so it's it's been quite a, a project between uh, John and the various different groups. How did you see this fitting in with this strategic plan, or how 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 is this document embedded into your that's how we want each other? Yeah, yeah. I think where we're headed with this is that in the 21st century, there's skills that go beyond knowing when Lincoln was killed. And these six attributes, two attributes, were identified from our parents as what they want, and from our kids and from our staff too. And so now, what we will do with our strategic planning is begin to build out. So, what does it mean? How do, how do we, you know, communication, communicators in around literacy, which is one of our main goals, but we want to begin to fill, you know, fill out the classroom to say, how do you use that? And so, Part of the strategic planning work Mark, would be to make sense of this for our classrooms and like science classrooms, how we teach critical thinking, um, social studies, how do you teach critical thinking? So that'll be part of the work that's kind of moving forward is to build out what this looks like in the classroom once we have that picture. Okay. Right. Any other questions? Yeah. Yeah. We'll get right on that image. <laughs> Well, I see it now, but I have to be really scared. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we'll work on that. We will revise that. That's good uh, before it goes out. <laughs> Any other feedback for revision? Are we good? Okay. 
Thank you. Appreciate the support. And if you have another thought down the road, just email me on it. Right. Moving on to action item four action items this evening. So the first one is a um, uh, Councilor Week proclamation. And I'll, I will read a proclamation uh, uh, recognizing this is Councilor Week. And then once I'm done, uh, we can have a motion to approve we'll do that and vote on it. So the proclamation reads, whereas school counselors are employed in public and private schools to help students reach their full potential. And whereas school counselors are actively committed to helping students explore their abilities, strengths, interests, and talents as these traits relate to career awareness and development. And whereas school counselors help parents focus on ways to further the educational, personal, and social growth of their children, and whereas school counselors work with teachers and other educators to help students explore their potential and set realistic goals for themselves, and whereas school counselors seek to identify and utilize community resources that can enhance and complement comprehensive school counseling programs and help students become productive members of society, and whereas comprehensive developmental school counseling programs are considered an integral part of the educational process that enables all students to achieve success in school. Therefore, the Forest Grove School Board of Directors do hereby proclaim February 6th to the 10th, 2023, as National School Council. I move that we approve the National School Council Week proclamation as presented. Second. Okay, moved and seconded. I will um, just go down the line. I'm a yes. I'm a yes. 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 And that motion passed. Thank you. Um, let's see, board oversight committee process. I think. Um, so as part of passing the 2022 bond, a requirement <coughs> of that is for us to establish a bond oversight committee. It's an independent uh, committee with citizens. So it's our board and community members, a couple of students. In the packet is a draft proposal for the charter for the bond oversight committee and application process. The application process would follow similar guidelines and requirements as our budget committee process. Um, what we're looking at is to have the first committee meeting start in April and then that we quarterly from then until we finish out setting the bond. Um, the chart or the committee would be charged with uh, reviewing the overall bond program, ensuring that we're spending bond funds according to the resolution that was passed, and just monitoring the overall spending of the bond. Um, Meetings would be held open to the public. They would be community meetings. Um, not they would be open to the public, but it would be a mid meeting of the uh, <laughs> the committee itself. Um, it would follow a lot of the same guidelines as the budget committee. So um, in that is a copy of the application, the charter. And so what we're looking for tonight is approval of this to move forward so we can post the application as soon as possible. Questions? Okay, thank you. Thank you. So I'll make a motion. I move to approve the board oversight committee process as presented. Second. 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 All right, moved and seconded. So um roll call vote and uh, again we'll time a yes right yes 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 yes, yes. Uh, motion passes thank you and it's the bond oversight yeah yeah not the board oversight yeah. <laughs> yes. i said board as well so oh. <laughs> you, you you said bond so you're correct I have just a quick follow up question, yeah. and it's probably listed here. How would this be communicated to the community for them to be part of it? Is there like a public relations part of it, or is that part of planning? 
can come in. So it would be announced um, meetings that are public, so community can come in and observe. Perfect. Those would be announced similar to Just what we do with the board meetings. The of the board, so it'll be it'll and the budget meetings. Page. And then for application process to be part of the committee, we would post that similar to what we do with the budget committee is the okay. news times, all of our social media, our district uh, webpage. So it would provide lots of opportunities for people to apply um, and we leave it open for just about a month before um, the board reviews applications. All right, the next agenda item is superintendent 316 evaluation questions. Um, as in previous years, the evaluation process will include performance goal, performance standards and 360 degree evaluation including the packet of questions to be asked in the 360 uh, evaluation. Questions are the same as in the past with the removal of questions specific to the pandemic. Uh, the survey was created to align with the board, Oregon School Boards Association uh, performance standards. So just in going back, I don't know how many, maybe three years now, two, two years, three, three years, we we would follow just those questions. And then when the pandemic came along, we added a question or two about how the superintendent was performing during the pandemic. So we've taken those out. So other than that, it's what we have used in the past and aligns with the Oregon School Board Association. So any questions about this? No. Okay. I move that the board of review and approve the questions as presented. We second. Okay, moved and seconded. Um, we'll call a vote. I, I'm a yes. 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 And uh, motion passes. Thank you. And then the last uh, action item this evening is surplus equipment and repairs. Thank you, Chair. Uh, the action before you is the uh, portion of school districts that have broken or obsolete technology hardware uh, that cannot be repaired and is no longer supported and or is no longer supported by the vendor manufacturer or is incompatible with existing software and system. Uh, because of this, the hardware has no significant resale value or and or cannot be really be repurposed. Uh, so it is determined to be surplus. Uh, the district works with recyclers and asset recovery companies to limit e-waste uh, from the surplus equipment. So the uh, recommendation uh, from administration uh, to the board today is to declare the provided list of broken obsolete technology hardware surplus and approve the district in working with electronics recyclers and asset recovery companies to collect and dispose of and process the product. I have a question. How long does the it varies. Our typical refresh cycle for things like a computer, anywhere from five to six years. We've stretched some equipment to as far as 10 years at times. Uh, but a lot of this, uh, as with the past uh, surplus, this one is mainly focused on Apple products, old iPads, and old MacBooks that Apple no longer supports and battery life on them is not existent anymore and or they have broken screens, broken keyboards, etc. Where are all these things? That was confused. <laughs> <laughs> this is still part of our post-pandemic kind of house cleaning. cleaning. Uh, things that the schools have started to return to us, things that were pulling from the warehouse. Uh, thankfully, because of additional staff we've been able to add, we now have kind of the staffing available to actually start going through all the boxes and actually start to inventory, start to assess. Uh, so, uh, so yeah, it's been a, quite a process. Yeah, it's a big one. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Any other questions? Uh, no other okay. I move that the board approve declaring a provided list of broken or obsolete technology hardware at surplus and approve working with electronic recyclers and asset recovery companies to collect and dispose or process the hardware. I second. Okay, moved and seconded. I am a yes. 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 Okay, thank you. Motion passes. That concludes the action. Yes.
And now the um, future items, we've got in front of you a set of policies. These policies are actually from the October 21st, but there were a couple of questions about them. So we pulled them out to make sure we could answer those questions. These, um, all the changes are due to changes in law. So you'll see these are all things that um, have to be changed because of changes in the law. Um, policies have been reviewed by the cabinet, changes suggested. These ones not so much because these are mostly relevant. I mean, the changes are around law, uh, but cabinet's seen them in the board policy committee. So they're in front of you tonight as the first reading. If there's any questions, give me a call so that we can kind of prep up some answers. And if you're wondering about anything, most of these, again, suspected sexual conduct, hazing, harassment, this, this is all based on kind of the laws that we're going to change. And then I would open it to Kate or to Mark if there's any other things here jumping out for you. I think so. We had some questions maybe about a couple of them, but I think those were resolved and yeah. answered. And, and, uh, you know, if, as Dave said, if there's questions, you can contact Dave. Otherwise, next time, at our next meeting, we will be fun. I have a question just out of curiosity. So I know this is by law, but at any point, is there a process where legal counsel looks at it just to make sure that we're on track? So we actually contract with um, OSBA and their lawyers are the ones who are actually making the proposals on this policy. So okay. it's not so much I, we, we contract with them to get that legal opinion. Okay, thank you. Uh, and the last item is future board items or board discussion. Are there any items board members would like to add to the current list? Um, are there any committees or other activities board members have attended that they would like to report on? So, either of those. Now it's January and it's the Christmas break and everything, so I'm not thinking this is fun. This is amazing. So, um, I should bring up on February 4th, we're hosting the legislative brunch now. Um, and it's going to be at the ESP. It'll be in the morning. I'll get you the times. This one is going to be, I mean, I'll be there lobbying, talking with our legislators around budget. But this is could be a, um, a one that would be, um, if you had some time, it would be nice to be able to talk with our legislators. Now, um, our legislators are excellent, and I know. But again, it's a Washington County is a big, big district, and we'll be trying to make sure we provide some education for folks uh, about what our schools need. And I'll give you the exact time, but it's February, Saturday, the 4th, I want to say, but I'll we'll give you the exact times. And generally, these, if you've been to one of these, they, um, you know, they're, they're normally earlier. They're normally about this time or maybe a week or two ago, actually. And so this is a little bit late. And, uh, um, yeah, you just can read the news about education issues. The biggest one that's coming up is financing for schools. And so that will be one of the hot, hot topics that day that, that legislators will hear from every district about is funding, current level of funding, what the state is projecting the fund at, what level. And a little bit of a maybe a disconnect between the current level, service level funding and funding. Is needed to move that funding forward a year with expenses and what the state is. So the the current the estimate of current service level is about one one point one five something like that one point two percent increase and inflation hasn't right. been at one point two percent. We've given the colas at four percent. I mean every district. There's nobody getting out of their negotiations right now for less than four percent. Um, so that's part of the, um, the disconnect here is, is that what they're offering doesn't even cover our rollups right now. So that would be the topic. Yeah. <laughs> so um, okay, I think uh, no other business. I think we'll close the meeting um, this evening at seven fourteen.